It was America's first span of paved highway through eight states and three time zones. It's amazing how different it looked in the 20s and even in the 30s, and it was always changing. Crossing grasslands, mountains, and deserts. I could look at a cow and tell you how much milk she had coming the next morning. Things like that you can see off of Route 66. Route 66, just, you know, driving with the windows down as fast as I can, you know. Just went through the hair, just loving life, you know. Route 66 is the road of flight, freedom, and the big second chance. I think one of the big lures to Route 66 is that it's an American icon. Just like you would go to Memphis to see Elvis, you'd come this way to see Route 66. Hi, I'm Peter Fonda. Join me on the ultimate road trip down Route 66. They call it the Mother Road. To hear it sing, all you have to do is aim at the heart and soul of America and step on the gas. It begins here in Chicago. From the husky, brawling city of the Big Shoulders, Route 66 takes you to the land of dreams, California. To much of the world, Route 66 is America. Limitless horizons, wide open spaces, the black top boogie to a new life. On 66, the never changing landscape flows by. The comfortable suburbs of Illinois and Missouri, the farmland of Kansas, Oklahoma's Great Plains, the harsh panhandle of Texas, ancient Indian land in New Mexico, Arizona's mountains, and finally, California's Mojave Desert and the Blue Pacific. But today, the mother road is hurting. Busted, torn up, and beaten down. Listen hard enough, though, and you can still hear her song. In 1946, a little-known musician drove west across America and tinkered with a tune his wife wanted him to call Route 40. But then Bobby Troop had a better idea. Get your kicks on Route 66. Troop's first song turned out to be his biggest hit and an early anthem for the cool and the hip. Get your kicks on Route 66 has been recorded by Nat King Cole, the Rolling Stones, and Depeche Mode, amongst many others. In 1960, a new TV series went on the air, making millions want to travel the mother road. The premise was simple. Two guys in a Corvette seeking adventure and finding trouble. Why don't you go away while you're still ahead? Don't crowd me, boy. Got a message? The show helped shape the image of Route 66 as a place for people who don't like rules, regulations, or limitations. Danger, violence, and the outlaw spirit, part of the open road, part of our image of it. In fact, those themes were part of my film, Easy Rider. Drive six miles west of Chicago and you find the town of Cicero, once ruled by mobster Al Capone, until Elliot Ness and his untouchables put him away. Route 66 was always fast, a good road to outrun the cops. Bonnie and Clyde stopped off along it to wash the blood from their hands. And when pretty boy Floyd wasn't robbing banks, he was enjoying the ladies who turned tricks on Route 66. 66 coming out of Joplin, Missouri, was a great road for those old whiskey peddlers and bootleggers to quench the thirst of Kansas and Oklahoma. The bootleggers are gone, but you can still get some history with your hash browns at the Dixie Truckers Home in McLean, a local institution since 1928. It gives you a taste of what used to be. 
That's fine with travelers like Steve Bellinger, who have long memories. Steve's one of the cowboys of the highway, a long haul trucker. He sometimes heads for the old route just to remember the old times. We used to get home cooked food, basically. I guess that's why they used to always say if you want to eat somewhere good, you got to stop where the truck drivers go. Well, now it's just, you know, we stop there because they have parking. That's as simple as that. It's, you don't have a choice. You can't go anywhere else. It seemed like now everybody wants to drive 100 miles an hour to get wherever they're going. It's like, we need to go from here to there, and we, we have so many days to do it. And they're not really stopping and looking, and they're not seeing anything. And that's kind of sad, because there's a lot here to see in this country. They're, they're missing a lot. They're missing America. If you want to do Route 66 right, you can't pass through Springfield, Illinois, without stopping at a local institution, the Cozy Drive-In, home of the Cozy Dog. People come here because they want my fries or my dogs, or they want to talk to me, or they just want to come to the Cozy Dog, because we've been here so many years. They remember that their mom and dad or their grandparents brought them here as little kids to get a Cozy Dog. I can remember Cozy Dog when I was a kid. It's just always been here. A little less than 300 miles from Chicago, you get to St. Louis, Missouri, the biggest city on the route. You might want to try what they call a concrete at Ted Drew's custard stand. It's a milkshake so thick, well, you get the idea. 163 miles more, you reach Lebanon, Missouri. The Munger Moss Motel is the place to stay. Lebanon also has its own Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Lanford Wilson. Tales of his hometown have haunted him and his plays for years. After grandmother died, Uncle Louis burned down the house for insurance. It was just a farmhouse. It was the oldest house in Lebanon, and it meant so much to me. And I still wonder, where is that teapot shaped like an elephant with a little rider on the top? What did you do? I hope, did you take that out before you burned down the damn house? You know, the house is still there for me. There must have been something, or I still must feel there's something wonderful about Lebanon, or I wouldn't be writing three plays. I wouldn't have written three plays that took place there. When things are not right, it don't make sense to me, and I get mad. And I got mad. Lebanon is where Howard Fuller took on City Hall. He didn't like it much when the local government tried to take away his favorite road. We wanted Route 66 as an address and they didn't recognize it as a road. They had missed it. So we got into a kind of an argument with them. I guess I was pretty honored. You... No, 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 Howard. We didn't make no mistake. You, you didn't... showed me what Route 66 was on Outer Road. You stood out there today called Outer Road, but the state, I thought, state recognizes I thought, it Outer Road, right? I Howard? thought in 1991 you said you put the Route 66 oh, signs up no, yourself. On, on I 44, Howard. We had to start a petition. Well, you start a petition, you go door to door, just knock on the doors, you go to the Walmart parking lot in January and you wear out a pair of boots stopping traffic in the parking lot, getting signatures, and we got them by the thousands. The route skims the bottom of the state of Kansas for about a dozen miles. reasons why we kind of uh, decided to go with a menu like this was that to give individuals a, a little bit different choice. You know, you've got more and more of these places like Cafe on the Route popping up, and I applaud that. It's great because it gives us a little more diversity, another choice, another option. But the thing that links it, that ties it all together, is this ribbon of asphalt and concrete that we call 66. Though little towns on the road like Baxter Springs benefit from new businesses, Route 66 has to fight to stay on the map. 
Welcome to Oklahoma. In the Choctaw Indian language, the land of the red people. 843 miles from Chicago, you find one of the last original stretches of Route 66. In Gary, Oklahoma, it runs right through the lives of people like Jim Ross. This particular road was paved in 1932. Just on the eve of the Dust Bowl, the Depression was already in full swing. This is the exact same road surface that the flivers and the flatbeds and the jalopies that migrated to California passed over. The exact same road. It's got a place in history, and it deserves to stay. I believe it's going to be very detrimental to the state of Oklahoma to tear up the longest piece of Route 66 in existence. The truck traffic here has decided that this piece of this highway is a shortcut. Rather than going down I-40, which you can see in the valley, and making an eight-mile round, they just make the three-mile jump, and that's, that's really the only reason this is being changed. It's a safety hazard. The old road can be like an old friend. And with its destruction, people here feel the past slipping away. I was out there with the group that was out at the highway where the construction's going on, hoping that we could save that portion of Route 66. Personally, for me, it is it is personal, because that's, that's a, a lot of family history down that road. And uh, I just hate to see something happen to it. Existing lanes are too narrow. They don't meet the safety standards of our current roads. Oklahoma State Highway Commissioner Neil McCaleb is on the other side of the road. He wants to sacrifice this part of Route 66. He came by that opinion the hard way, since his family has deep roots in the old road. My father participated in the design and construction of major portions of 66. My dad is deceased now. The only real traces of him that I see are the bridges that he left behind. But there's some pain in it. There's some pain in progress. Take the freeway and you miss the blue whale in Catoosa, Oklahoma. 30 years ago, it was an anniversary present from Hugh Davis, an African explorer, to his wife, Zelta, an animal lover. The round barn in Arcadia, Oklahoma, got its shape because, as the story goes, the devil can't get you in a corner in a round barn. Home to generations of fiddle players and revelers, it's been restored by the pennies and dimes of Route 66 travelers. After the bustle of Chicago, the farmlands of Missouri and Kansas, the cattle farms and oil fields of Oklahoma, you come to the biggest state on Route 66, Texas. In Groom, you'll find the largest cross in North America, reaching 190 feet above the prairie. And in Amarillo, there's a landmark that requires a Texas-sized appetite to be fully appreciated. You have to eat the salad. You do not have to eat the cracker. You do not have to eat the tomato. Route 66 is a ribbon of emotion and memory stretching halfway across America, but the ribbon is faded and frayed. Today, the interstate is eating away the old places, the places with character. Often, ghosts are all that remain. Ghosts remembered by those with a passion for the old road, like writer Michael Wallace. I was born near Route 66. I grew up near Route 66. It was where I saw my first cowboys and Indians, where I saw my first oil pump jacks, where I stole my first kiss. It means a lot to me. Before Route 66, America's interstate highways were little better than dusty trails. Motorists clamored for a better way to get from here to there. The solution came from Cyrus Avery, head of the American Association of State Highway Officials. He campaigned for a safe and fast two-lane highway from Chicago to Los Angeles, which just happened to dip into his hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. In 1926, Route 66 officially opened, 
A foot race was organized as a promotional ploy to draw traffic to the new road. Within two years, we put Route 66 on everybody's map with this great foot race from LA to Chicago and then on beyond Route 66 to New York to Madison Square Garden. And it was won by a little Oklahoma farm boy named Andy Payne. He won $25,000. He beat out world-class runners. He crossed the Mojave. He ran through the altitudes. He ran through the wheat fields. And it was really inspiring in this age when people were eating goldfish, wearing raccoon coats, and sitting on flagpoles and doing marathon dances. It took a stunt, but it put Route 66 on the map. If you ever plan to motor west, travel by way, take the highway, that's the best. Get your kicks on Route 66. It winds from Chicago to Route 66 skims the top of the Lone Star State. Miles all the in summer, you can fry here in the Panhandle, but there's something else cooking at the Big Texan Steakhouse in Amarillo. Oh, yeah. This place is as American as a 72-ounce steak. Up here on stage, we have to my left is Daryl, to my right is Lucy. They are both from Australia. They have one hour to eat 72 ounces of meat, salad, shrimp cocktail, baked potato, and bread. If they do this in an hour, they'll become the newest members of Texas' most exclusive club, the 72 ounce steak club. Daryl's our man. Because Daryl's been brought up with the outback and the lifestyle. He's a man, he's been brought up on the ranch style home life. Not far from the Big Texan, out in an open field, you'll find Cadillac Ranch, the hood ornament of Route 66. We're glad you're here. Hang around. In 1974, an entrepreneur named Stanley Marsh III commissioned the Ant Farm Design Group to bury 10 Cadillacs nose down in concrete. Out here in the West, where men are men, we like to pull our wagons in the circle. Sometimes those wagons are Cadillacs. Day, Marsh encourages visitors to add their own mark. Route 66, I think, embodies so many icons. And I'm talking about everything from James Dean and automobiles. We idolize the road and we idolize those big cars with heavy engines and, and fins and chrome. Cadillac Ranch is an abstract vision of a lost America on the road of dreams. But for some, the road was a nightmare. I asked my mother, what is all this talk about uh, people going to take a trip and go away and leave this place? She said, well, that's what a lot of people are doing. There's no work here for Papa to find. We were in the back of this truck with a seat, and I cried. You know, tears rolled down my face because I thought, well, this is goodbye forever. When Iva Helm was a little girl in the early 1930s, drought ravaged the Great Plains. Thousands of families set out westward on Route 66 for what they hoped would be a better life in California. It was the largest migration in United States history. The term Oki was a, more or less a derogatory name, you know, for people, and they were looked down as trashy people. The children suffered from the name calling, from being Okies and being looked down on and not having maybe the clothes that the other kids had. And my brothers that were younger than me they didn't take it very easy because they would punch them in the nose, you know, I mean, it was, it sometimes became fights and little gang fights. We started paying our dues on Route 66. The Depression, the Dust Bowl, 
Hope was as scarce as the rainwater, and people took to the road. The busted tenant farmers, the people from Arkansas, the Arkies from southern Missouri, from Oklahoma, from the panhandle of Oklahoma, out no man's land, from Texas. They took to the road and they looked to rebuild their lives, to mend their dreams, to find some hope. We as children would laugh at the poor Oki because he only had one mattress on the top of his car. And we'd say, oh boy, here comes a rich Oki. He's got two mattresses. It, it was a tough time for America. How sad. John Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath, told the story of this desperate time. The book focused on a family called the Jodes and their journey on Route 66 and they come into 66 from the tributary side roads, from the wagon tracks and the rutted country roads. 66 is the mother road, the road of flight. In 1940, Hollywood made a movie based on the novel. It starred my father, Henry Fonda, as Tom Joad. The role made him famous and won him a place in the hearts of movie fans around the world. The old road threads its way through American history, too. The Depression, the Dust Bowl. Many of the towns left behind by Interstate 40 became ghosts. The railroad was here. We had a, uh, you know, a depot and a stockyards across the street from the Texaco station. We would like to go over there and look at the animals sometimes, and I know we had a hard time crossing the road because <laughs> it was so busy. I love those ghost towns. I think they're just as important to Route 66 as the bustling towns, as the thriving towns. And I look at those derelict buildings staring back at me with those empty windows and doors, and I think of what had been there. The old highway has seen artists and troubadours. Some fade into the landscape. Others become legendary. Brad Paisley, a young country music artist remembers those who traveled the road before him. I know for a fact that Hank Williams had to come right by here in a Cadillac. So did Billy Walker and Bill Anderson and Porter Wagner and little Jimmy Dickens and all these people that are now, you know, heroes and some friends of mine, and they would take Route 66. What an incredible experience to be crammed in a Cadillac, five of you with a bass fiddle and a bunch of guitars in the trunk, taking your music across to the various honky-tonks right along that highway. And the inspiration to me is with the common man and with the, you know, everyday life, and you see it from that road, and you miss it on the interstate. I see so many colorful faces. I mean, you've got Dean who can twist his feet all the way around backwards, but he's one of those small town, colorful Andy Griffith characters almost that are getting lost in the big cities of today. <laughs> Very funny. Where'd you learn that, Dean? The old road listened with an unbiased ear. It carried jazz men, country western crooners, and rhythm and blues artists. It took them from Chicago to St. Louis to Los Angeles and back as they searched for fame, fortune, and the perfect gig. Musicians and entire musical styles came of age on Route 66. 
Bluesman Buddy Guy remembers one long, strange trip early in his career with the king of the slide guitar, M.R. James. Before Elmo James died, we left here on it, and he was driving the station wagon. He told me, he said, well, we're down to the last $3, and uh, I'm going to put $2 worth of, a dollar worth of gas in the car, and we got the drink that's buy a bottle of whiskey for the other, and we were on 6 to 6 10. And uh, he said, because my guys don't drive good unless they be drinking. I'm like sitting back there praying, because I had never been on the road before. Fourteen hundred miles west of Chicago, a long way from the Windy City, you might find a lone man on a lonely road. He is in the contest of his life. The cheering crowd may only be in his head, but as he trains along a part of Route 66 that used to be an old Indian trail, Philip Castillo believes he can go the distance. I used uh, Route 66 to train for speed and track uh, when I was accustomed to running on a track. We didn't have a track here. Philip, a member of the Akama tribe, is training for the Olympics, a dream born from generations of struggle. The Akama lived here before the white men began to record time. Before there were cars, what would become Route 66 was called the Old Trail. American Indian labor helped build 66, and the road brought tourists to the reservation. When Interstate 40 came through, the tourists defected to the fast road. The Akama were all but forgotten. The village that survived a thousand years could become another ghost town like Glen Rio. But then the tribal elders found a way to fight back. It was literally a gamble. The casino they built helped fund a new school and senior center. Philip Castillo's community now has new hope and a new hero. In terms of uh, traditional running within my culture, it's very, very popular and it's always been an integral part of our history. I hope that a lot of Indian people will see me run on TV and, uh, and I hope that it will inspire a lot of young Indian kids to pursue running as well. Route 66. You can chase your dreams on its twists and turns and open your heart to its vistas. But some people say if you want to feel the adrenaline, you just got to cut loose and let the road fly by. If you ever plan to bowl the bus, travel Whether you floor it and let the scenery turn into a blur, or stop at every town, Route 66 makes you want to appreciate the moment. It winds from Chicago to LA. No other road in America can offer you such a rich tapestry of nostalgia, emotion, and history. Route 66 is a road you feel. Ken Kemper is riding it on an electric bike to find inspiration for his novel. I plan on getting stories from different people along the route about all of the things that have happened to them in their lives on 66. 2,400 miles in the saddle. That's a fine goal for an 18-year-old, but Ken is 60-something. His passion is taking him on a classical journey inspired by the Grapes of Wrath. And he's collecting stories to write the great American Route 66 novel. When I come into town, the motorhome follows me. It goes ahead of me to let him know that I'll be in that town in about two hours. And then he sets up, and then we start letting people come and give us their stories and tell us all the things that they've done on Highway 66. They'll come across the street to meet you and sit down and talk to you or even have a cup of coffee with you. I get your kicks on Route 60. People along Route 66 get like talking to people. On Route 66. But comme aux Etats-Unis, tout va très vite. Et ben voyez, le carton est arrivé ce soir et uh, I did it. Philippe Le Carrier is a tour guide from Paris who has done the route dozens of times on his Harley. 
que nous, Français, nous ne dénotons pas tellement. Je pense que nous, Français, nous nous sommes très bien ici. We get a good reception. At first, there is a bit of surprise because people wonder why we came from so far away to drive on a motorcycle. Then, past the surprise, there is a form of respect that pretty quickly evolves into friendship. We make friends on Route 66. Actually, I had the image of very busy people, extremely work-oriented, but to the contrary, I found much more relaxed and very friendly people. When we were on the road on the motorcycle, 